When Jesus came to Caesarea, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, he's asking them, what's my name and how does it relate to my function? Who am I? Well, good morning and welcome again to Sunday morning worship here at CBC. Uh, if you're watching this on a Sunday morning, I'd like you to know that we are open for in-person services. We have a limited amount uh, due to the governmental re regulations, but um, uh, every Sunday morning, uh, this particular sermon is also being preached live. So what you are seeing on uh, the internet is also being preached live by myself, probably, and maybe even someone else occasionally. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I am uh, doing a sermon today that has somewhat of a national relevance. Uh, the sermon title is called Obecha, When Your Name is Changed. And for those of you who don't know yet, you might be shocked to know that Port Elizabeth, one of the larger uh, port cities in South Africa, uh, its name has officially been changed to Obecha. And I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, uh, if anybody knows any better, you're welcome to mention that in the comments uh, or send me a voice note as to how to get that click 100% correct. And so I, I thought with all the controversy, because I've been watching the feeds on various social media platforms um, and people's opinions, I've been watching the news media as well, um, and just getting people's responses to the name changes. And uh, people respond in various ways. Some are very positive and some are very negative, And some are just completely ignorant. And uh, there's, there's always room for ignorance, isn't there? Um, and so uh, I, I just speak the thought. And, and I was looking at doing something similar anyway. Uh, the, the name change of Port Elizabeth and a few other smaller towns in the Eastern Cape has just hastened that process. And so I want to look at what happens when your name is changed and what's the big significance of a name anyway. I'm going to be looking at John chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 16 um, in a few moments' time. But just as a point of interest, uh, people change their names all the time uh, for various reasons. I'm going to be looking at it publicly uh, today. But those in the entertainment industry... Uh, many of them, if not most of them, choose a stage name uh, for the predominant reason that the original name, the given name, is not as cool as what they would like it to be. Um, I've thought about uh, if I were some well-known movie star, um, what my name would be, and I can't really think of one. If you have any ideas, feel free to mention it in the comment section below. But just to give an example, and I'll start off easy, uh, I think you should know who these people are, uh, but Alicia Keys, the songstress, um, her real name is Alicia O'Gallo Cook. Um, her surname is not Keys, uh, that's just an artistic play and a cool sounding surname. Uh, actress Natalie Portman, who's been acting since a child already, uh, her real name is Netta Lee Hirschlag. Um, and that sounds like she could come from, uh, you know, a little dorpy here somewhere in the Western Cape, Natalie. Um, but her real name is Natalie Hirschlag. Uh, her stage name is Natalie Portman. Bruno Mars, uh, the singer, very popular singer, uh, his real name is Peter Jean Hernandez. And then Calvin Harris, got no clue who he is. His real name is Adam Richard Wiles. Uh, is he a singer? Is he an actor? Do you guys know? You don't know either. Well, whoever Calvin Harris is, singer, actor, model, whoever you are, sir, your real name is Adam Richard Wiles. The point is that people change their names willingly for greater acceptance, for a broader appeal, and just to appear better than what we truly are. Um, of course, they don't usually respond to these names, I would suppose, personally, and their given names for their true friends and very close inner circles still call them uh, upon their true identities. 
But some people take offense when names are changed and so forth. It's related to the history and the argument is thrust before us as to whose history gets precedence in the current age and so forth. I'm not here to answer any of those questions. I want to look at the significance of a name and ask the question, uh, what happens when your name is changed and why is it changed? Turn with me to John chapter 1, 35 to 42. It reads as follows. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them uh, following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. So Cephas is Aramaic and uh, Peter is Greek. Uh, Matthew 16 then reads as follows. So the first account I just read from John 1 is where Jesus changes Peter's name for the first time. The second one is the more famous passage where Jesus affirms this name change, but it has a little bit more meaning and depth to it uh, via this experience, which I will read for you now. Matthew 16, 13 to 20. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, we asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. May God add a blessing to the public reading and exposition of his word. Pray with me for a moment. Father, in the name of Jesus, we commit the sermon to you, and I pray, dear Lord, as we explore ideas of identity, of names and its changes, dear Lord, and its applications, I ask you to be gracious to us, give us deep insight into our own lives, and allow us, dear Lord, Father, to feast on that which you put before us today. We ask this for your sake, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So the first thing I want to start off with, just as we've read those two passages, are um, what are the three things that a name does for you and me? Um, and I've put them all under the letter P. And the first thing that a name does is it serves as a placeholder. Uh, think of uh, going to a nice dinner party. Uh, something that's uh, planned and, and, and really um, finitely arranged. Uh, all the details are planned. And usually what uh, they would have at these dinner parties is that the seating arrangements are, um, you know, are very carefully constructed. They make sure they put people who can chat to one another and get along with one another and keep enemies away from one another so that the dinner can be a success. And usually they would have uh, very cute looking name tags either on your seat, uh, on, your, on your plate, or maybe uh, on the table where you're supposed to be seated. And that lets you know whose place this is. And so a name gives you a place in this world that anchors your sense of being. Even you know what you are called. Uh, it doesn't relate necessarily to your existence because you can see that you're here, you can feel that you're here, you can interact and engage with yourself and so can other people, but having a name solidifies the experience of yourself. It's a placeholder in this world. It makes it easier to communicate. You're not just a nameless person and when they say, hey, you, 
it, it brings about a, a greater sense of respect for your existence and your functioning. So what a name does for you, number one, it's a placeholder. It defines a space for you to function with dignity and respect. Number two, uh, name, uh, names also function as a prophecy. Uh, and the um, prophecy over here um, is very often people want to know what the meaning of my name is. Either your first name or your surname. Um, and somehow we find significance in that. This is not foreign to the Bible. It's quite common uh, that the names given by parents, especially if they were prophets themselves, like Isaiah, uh, no loot, no plunder, quick money. Uh, in fact, the actor Mahershala Ali is named after Isaiah's second son, which means quick money. Um, and so this whole idea uh, that your name carries weight in terms of constructing a path for a little baby that has got no clue as to what his tomorrow might hold. And the name somehow serves as a prophecy as to the possible character of the child and the possible experience that the child will have growing up and engaging this world. But also, the prophecy, as in the case of Isaiah, might not be for the child itself. The prophecy might be for the community at large, for the nation, and maybe even the world. And in the case of Isaiah's first two kids, not even the nation of Israel, it applied to other people like Samaria and so forth. But it has a prophetic application. Personally, and even to others. I'll say more about that when we look at the passage particularly. And then the third thing, and this is the only negative in the, uh, the threesome of things that a name does for you, it sometimes serves as a pseudonym. And here we can include nicknames. I had a few nicknames growing up. I didn't appreciate most of them. There was one or two I didn't mind because uh, it kind of added to my uh, sense of well-being and, and how I felt about myself. But the others took away from that. It was kind of insult, so to speak, and it's usually those ones that stick. But a pseudonym, what is a pseudo means false and num means name. And so it is a false name that is thrust upon you. And what this tries to do is to kind of change your identity or change the positive direction that your life is supposed to go in. And let me tell you that God wants you to move in a positive direction. Sometimes the given name that you have is the pseudonym. Sometimes it's not a prophecy. Your parents just chose it because it sounds cool. In fact, some of the names these days, I don't even know if you could find a, a, a kind of a root for it because some of the names are just like way out there, uh, just made up combinations of four different names and they don't really mean anything. So don't place too much premium on the prophetic aspect of your name, especially if no consideration for it has been given in the first place. But a pseudonym is uh, the type of phenomenon like Daniel. Daniel, the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament, is a young, promising man along with his friends, and they get taken into exile to Babylon. One of the first things that the Babylonians do is they don't only take your stuff, they only take your land, and they don't only take you away from your land, so it's a complete system of disorientation and then reculturization, is they rename you. So Daniel moves from Daniel to Belteshazzar. And so they want him to forget about his Jewish Jehovah worshipping roots and they want him to adopt the culture and the religion and the gods of Babylon. Daniel of course understands you can change my name, you can change my food and you can change my culture but devoted to Jehovah I will stay. Uh, another example would be Jesus. Now, they didn't really try to change Jesus' physical name, but they tried to change what that name meant. So when the Pharisees and the Sadducees see that Jesus is performing all these miracles and that he's raising the dead, healing the sick, uh, teaching uh, with authority like no man before him and no man since has ever done, uh, they look at Jesus and they say, we haven't seen a power like this before. And the only way that they can interpret this, because this shows their worldview, what they really thought of God, is, well, you must be Beelzebub, which was just the, the Lord of the flies, the Lord of the dead, that which feasts on rotten flesh. And they think that Jesus must be operating by this demonic, devilish power. And so they call him 
Beelzebub. Jesus, of course, then says, well, this reveals who you are because that's what you can see. And you are, in fact, uh, sons of the devil. You, the, the father of lies is who you listen to. And so there is an attempt to rename Jesus. A pseudonym. Don't fall for that trick, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters. But you want to operate in the identity and the name that God gives you. Now, with all of that said as an introduction, let me go to um, the, uh, the passages that we read earlier. And uh, the first one is John chapter 1, 35 to 42. Uh, I've read it already, so let me just jump straight into the teaching points here. Uh, the first thing that I want to mention over here uh, is that the menu is not the meal. Now, uh, this, this is a combination of this prophetic nature of a name and also the kind of pseudonym nature of a name. And of course, right in between there, you will have another P, which is perfection, and in our sense, it's really imperfection. And that's the human condition that where God gives us a gift that is right, that is true, that is perfect, usually human nature in me messes it up to some degree, doesn't change the nature of God's gift, it just means that the imperfect has touched the perfect, and although it sanctifies me to a large degree, I also mess up the gift many times. And so, when I come into the identity that Christ gives me, I need to understand that the name that was given me by an imperfect parental team, that the name was given me by an imperfect culture, touched by the finger of Satan, but protected by the overworking plan of God, then I need to understand what place it has and how it functions in my life. You see, because just like in the Old Testament, when uh, Jabez received his name, he understood that the name can't set the agenda if it is negative. I mean, I wonder, for instance, how many mothers or fathers name their little daughters Jezebel? Because, of course, the name Jezebel doesn't have a very good connotation from Scripture. And so the, this idea that if you have that name, you are now fatally designated to experience everything that that name in its etymological negativity means, you have to experience that. And that's not so. I don't know what your name means. Now, my name is Peter. It's here in the text. It's, it's very similar. And I can see similarities to I'm, I'm quick with a mouth, sometimes too quick. Um, I'm a little bit of a pioneer. Yeah, that's a positive way to say that I, I try and be first and most of the time I get it wrong and so I'm rash, I'm stubborn, uh, the, the, the name rock could mean stable, it could also mean clip cup and uh, un unmovable and if I were an animal I'd probably be a donkey and move when I'm not supposed to and stand when I'm not supposed to, I'm stubborn. But I don't have to resign myself to that because this is this thing called discipleship and sanctification and progress. You see the name on the menu is not the meal. And so again, think of yourself at this dinner party and your name is there and even the menu is there for the night and you're going to have three starters, entrees. And then you're going to have a main meal with a, a lamb encrusted in black pepper and mustard. Mm, I'm getting hungry. And you're going to have a great uh, dessert with blue flames jumping out of it. That's not the meal. You've just read... On the menu, what the meal is, but you haven't consumed it yet. So don't put too much weight in the prophecy of your name, especially if it's negative. And don't put too much name in the prophecy in, uh, of your name, whatever that means, if it's positive. And I'll tell you why. You see, I'm going to speak about two words that sound the same. There is fate, as in this is what's going to happen. You know, it's destiny. And so we talk about fatalism as in destinyism. You see, if you've got a positive name, you might slack on the discipline part of your life because you think that if I just uh, 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 believe that my name ne means pioneer, and if I just believe that my, my name means forward thinking, and if I just believe that my name means stability, and I don't put in the hard work of discipline and sanctification and submission to God, then the positivity of my, of my name means absolutely nothing. You could call me whatever you want to, but a stubborn man by any other name is still stubborn. 
course, Shakespeare is famous for saying that a rose called anything else would still smell as sweet. And so I want you to understand that even positively, if you are uh, fatalistic, as in uh, destiny, uh, you still have to put in the work. But then there's this other word, fatal, as in deathly. Some people are fatalistic, and you've got a name, so Peter would go positive or negative, and it means stubborn. It means hard. Maybe even, not hard of mind, never changes, but could maybe even mean hard of heart as well. The mind and the heart are, are very closely connected. And so, if I were to adopt a fatalistic approach to this, and then the fatalistic approach would say, there's no hope for me. I am destined to die in my stubbornness. I am destined to die in my uh, 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 immovability. I won't move forward because, well, my name is Peter. And I refuse to accept that. Neither should you be fatalistic in terms of destiny or fatalistic in terms of death. So, the menu is not the meal. Whatever your name is, you submit to the direction and the calling of God. There are plenty of people who had negative names in Scripture. It wasn't a death knell. It was simply a name that God had given for a particular time of prophecy, and it meant something to a broader audience, but they could live beyond the curse of a negative name, or they could live beyond the inertia of a positive name. Number two, whoever names you, owns you. So look at John chapter 1 again. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. So this is Andrew and Peter, oh, before he's Pe uh, uh, um, Peter, and they are spending time with John the Baptist. John the Baptist sees his cousin and says, there goes the Lamb of God. And immediately they drop John, and they follow Jesus. Can I just stop here for a moment very quickly? If you are following a wise man that is within the framework of what the Holy Spirit is doing or in the framework of Christianity, and you're following that person, that wise man or wise woman, more than you are following Jesus himself, then you need to drop whoever that is and follow Jesus and Jesus alone. If you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I don't care what church you go to. I don't care how established your church is. I don't care what your church did in the past. I don't care how famous your pastor is. I don't care how gifted your preacher is. I don't care what legacy or history lies within the annals of your church denomination. What I do care is, are you following Jesus? And let me be explicit about this. Not that I've got anything to brag about or anything close to preachers who are a gazillion times bigger than me. But if you are putting your trust in me, I make a terrible savior. In fact, I make a terrible human being. And I make a much worse savior. So don't put your trust in the preacher. Do not put your trust in the, the Christian movement. Do not put your trust in, uh, in Christian celebrities. Put your trust in Jesus alone. Drop me. Follow Jesus. Drop the fancy preacher. Follow Jesus. I'm not saying don't listen to us. I'm not saying you can't be taught the word of God by us. But you don't follow me. You follow Jesus. And so this is what they did to their credit. They were with John the Baptist, the second greatest man to walk the earth. And trust me, there are plenty of candidates for that title. And so when John the Baptist points to Jesus, and that's what a great leader does, he points to Jesus, and he doesn't mind if you leave. I've often said, folks, uh, my job is not to grow the church as my primary mandate. It's to grow the kingdom. And I'd like to grow the Claremont Baptist Church. I'd like more people to come. I'd love to see us bursting at the seams. But not because you're coming to see anybody in particular, because you're coming to worship the Lord, and you're coming to be a part of His plan. And I'd also like to think that if you had to go somewhere else, and if you had to find greater meaning at another place of worship because your experience of Jesus is slightly better, and I'm not talking about consumerism in the church, I'm talking about truly God moving you, I can tell you now, Pastor Peter would be happy to release you. But this is what they do. John points to Jesus. They realize we've got to drop you, John, and move to Jesus. And off to Jesus they go. And the first thing that Jesus says is, well, not the first thing, 
Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of those who heard that John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. Jesus looks at him without saying, hello, maybe he did. And, you know, uh, John just doesn't record it here. But the first thing Jesus does, he says, um, you are Simon, son of John, and now you will be called Cephas. Now, important to note here. So, yes, point number. First point is the menu is not the meal. Point number two, don't put too much weight and premium on the prophecy of your name. The positivity or the negativity. And number two is whoever names you, owns you. You see, um, if you are the creator of a thing, you get to name it. All right? Uh, even your own children. One of the great pr privileges of bearing children is that you get to name those children. Now, when they come of age, if they don't like the name, they can change the name legally if they want. I heard of a, a man in Belgium a good few years ago, was such a huge Manchester United fan, um, he changed his name officially to Manchester United. Silly fellow, should have changed it to Liverpool rather. But the point is, when you become of age, you are able to change your name because you now own yourself. Up until 18, your parents literally own you, legally own you. And so Jesus is saying over here, before anything else, when you come to him, he wants to establish in Peter's life this fact, and by implication to all of us, I own you. I get to name you. I get to call the shots in your life. Even something as basic as naming you, that's what I do. I am God, and if you're going to follow me, you have to submit to me owning you. Not just owning your ways, not just owning your morality, not just owning possibly certain aspects of your future. I own you past present and future. I own you etymologically. I own you philosophically. I certainly own you theologically and I will own you practically. He owns you and I. So Jesus looks at him and says, Simon, son of John, he knows your past and he knows your present. He knows who you are. He knows who your parents are. But you're going to be called Cephas, Peter. And it's kind of like... Um, you know, these uh, artists who just have like one name. It's, it's, it's so cool. You know, I don't even know his real name, but uh, back in the day, he used to be a bit of a fan. Prince. And then he had no name. He was the artist formerly known as Prince. In other words, he, he never had a name. But you know, these, these artists who just have a single name. Uh, it always appears so cool. And this is kind of what Jesus does for Peter over here. You are Simon, son of John. But you will be called Cephas, Peter, the rock, the epitome of stability, uh, strength, moving forward. The menu is not the meal. Whoever names you, owns you. Won't you please submit to the ownership of God? He wants to name you. He wants to define you. He wants to give you a fresh new understanding of your identity in Christ. We've got two more points to get through and then we're done. Turn with me to Matthew 16, 13 to 20. And, G and it says this. So when Jesus came to Caesarea, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? In other words, he's asking them, what's my name? And how does it relate to my function? Who am I? Because that's what a name reveals as well. And my point here is not that actually. My point is that revelation leads to renaming. So we know that the menu is not the meal. We know that whoever names you owns you. But we also now know that revelation leads to renaming. So number one, God reveals a new name to Peter. That's right at the beginning of John when he meets Jesus. Now he's going to solidify and establish this concept even further in Peter's life as it is revealed to Peter who Jesus is. So some say Jesus is uh, um, you know, a prophet, and others say that um, Jesus is um, Elijah and so forth, um, or Jeremiah. Uh, then he says, but what about you? Who do you say I am? And then Simon Peter, again, forward-thinking, pioneer, first to get there, and he displays every positive thing about his name. He says, you are the Messiah, the son 
of the living God. Now, flesh and blood did not reveal this to Peter. The Holy Spirit revealed this to Peter. And then Jesus says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. If I had time, folks, I would speak to you about the convergence of the old and the new into the explosion and cascading of the present. Perhaps next week we'll look at this. And I tell you that you, Peter, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell or Hades will not overcome it. And so as he receives this revelation from the Holy Spirit, as he functions in divine knowledge and not just on earthly common knowledge, his identity and his name is established and the two function as parallels. Not only does he have a name that's positive and that takes him forward, he now has an action that will speed the uh, parallel nature of and the consistency of what I'm called and what I do. There's no break. There's no uh, psychological crisis because what I'm called and what I do is so divergent. He's coming closer and it's all the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the revelation of God. If you want a great sense of identity, if you want a name change because your name is uh, negative, or perhaps it's inertia, your name is positive, uh, but your life doesn't match up to it, you need a revelation of the Son of God. You need to focus on Jesus. You need to be Christ-centered. You need to possibly go through a period of fasting and praying. And you need to say, Lord, just like Jacob, whose name was also changed when he wrestled with God for revelation and for blessing. I will not let go. I will not leave until you show me something, Holy Spirit. Until you reveal to me the deeper riches of my faith in you. Until you speak to me in a real sense. Revelation leads to renaming, leads to a new identity or a new experience of your new identity. And last but not least, when it comes to Jesus, and there's more to be said, but time is running out. In verse 20, Jesus says, Right. Um, so this revelation has led you to a new sense of identity, but also a new efficacy in life and in ministry. And so, yes, the foundation, the revelation, is what the church is going to be built upon, but also upon the bride of Christ. And just by the way, uh, I, I know things are different in our modern day and age, and not every woman does this or every uh, wife does this. But usually, uh, as with, in, in our case, my wife did this, uh, she gave up her maiden surname, Adam's, and took my surname, Cornelius, when she got married to me. Some people have a double bell surname and it's hyphenated. Some people keep their own surname. If you're a celebrity, you, whatever your stage name is, never really changes. But the, the, this idea that um, uh, we are the bride of Christ means that God gets to name me. He, he owns me. Also, this idea that when you adopt a child, and we were always hoping to do that, and it might still be an option in the future, who knows, but when I adopt this little child, I'm not only adopting him just to live in a new space. I'm giving this child a new history and a new legacy, which is mine. I'm giving him a new name, and maybe not his first name, but certainly his surname. Whatever he was or she was, probably a she if it was me, and she will now become a Cornelius. I'm really getting visions of walking my daughter down the aisle and giving her almost to be a husband a big stern look at says, hurt her and you're dead. Anyway. I'm running ahead. The point is, you get a new name when you are adopted and we are adopted in Christ Jesus. We are his little brothers. We get a new name and identity when we marry and we are the bride of Christ. You see, he owns us. And we also become more effective when we get this name, when this revelation of who we are, when our identities are solidified in Christ we are able to do major exploits in Christ. Listen to what Peter is able to do now when he understands who he is and who Christ is and that the two come together. So there's, there, there are two cascades. The one is the past and the present cascading and, the, and, and it creates a positivity. The second one is uh, your identity being fully known, God's identity being fully revealed, they come together and they cascade and they create an explosion of effective ministry. 
It says here that what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, heaven and earth come together. I know what heaven is. I know what earth is. I understand the order of things. I'm completely secure and stable in my identity. I can function in ministry more effectively. I pray that for you. Pray it for me as well. Not only do I want to be an effective preacher, I want to be an effective practitioner. I want people to come to know Jesus. I want people to grow in the Lord because of what I say and what I do. And where I do fail, don't follow me. But where I preach the truth and where I model the truth in action, may you be blessed and may you follow. And for all the other Christian leaders, may it be the same for all of us. But last but not least, Revelation, of course, leads to renaming. Last point is some people can't handle your name. There's always going to be this idea that your anointing, that your calling, that your uh, efficacy in ministry is going to be too much for some people. My wife and I experienced this, um, not just ourselves, but with many other people, and, and we've counseled some people to say, don't stop shining because other people can't handle your glare. Jesus understood this. That's why in verse 20 about himself, he's saying, listen, I don't need unnecessary trouble right now. The time is coming. The trouble is written into my contract, but it's not time yet. So what I'm asking you to do, so Jesus did the supernatural when people went through the frame of a cliff. He, he just stopped time and he froze everybody and he just walked out of the crowd. He did it supernaturally. And here he's now doing it naturally. He's saying, guys, but time has not come. He says he ordered, again, ordered, he owns. You can only order what you own and have authority over. His disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Because some people can't handle the glare of your shine. Some people can't handle the prophecy of your name. Some people can't handle your overcoming the negativity of your name. Some people can't handle the verbosity of the success of your story. Some people can't handle how tenacious you are in the circumstances that you are, and you still made a success. Some people can't handle that you're more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. Every obstacle thrust before you, every challenge put in front of you, everything that is meant to bring you down, you overcome in Jesus' name. Some people can't handle that. And so be careful that you guard your name with great precision, great care. And you are careful who you give your name to and what you attach your name to. I was watching an interview a good few months ago. Um, I, I love documentaries and interviews. I learn a lot more uh, than just like normal entertaining movies. Um, and this particular interview was on wrestling. and It was um, interviewing um, Hulk Hogan. That's not his real name, by the way. I forget his real name now. Um, and um, Hulk Hogan was sharing how he lost out on hundreds of millions of dollars just because the timing was wrong. Now, this isn't a sermon on timing. Um, this is a sermon on the glare. And some people can't handle your name, and you've got to be careful about what you attach your name to. So Hulk Hogan had an agent, and this agent was the same agent as the agent who was, the, he was also the agent of George Foreman. You might see where I'm going with this. So he phones Al Gogan. He says, listen, I've got this product. I've got this grill. Right? It's, it's gonna, it's, it's, this is going to be big. Get back to me, because he leaves them here. This is before the days of cell phones. Get back to me as soon as you can. Um, I want to know if you're willing to attach your name to this grill. Um, well, long story short, he doesn't get the, the message timelessly. And so the agent then phones George Foreman. And says, listen, would you like to attach your name? We'll market this thing. It will bear your name and everything. Uh, is this something you can see yourself doing? George Foreman says immediately, yes. And the rest is history. He's made hundreds of millions of dollars from the George Foreman grill. Uh, Hulk Hogan got some type of blender or something which didn't sell too well and didn't make him anywhere close to the type of money that the grill made for George Foreman. The point is celebrities understand that if I'm going to attach my name to something, it's got to be right, it's got to be qualitative, and it's got to be effective. You need to do the same thing. Now, we, we're not famous. There's no one banging down my door, and probably the people I know, there's, you know, no one is banging down the door with a $100 million Nike sponsorship. Would you please say good things about our product? But we do attach our names to certain actions, uh, sometimes even certain vices. You, you don't want your name attached to it. 
You don't want to be known for some type of moral failure. You want to be known for some type of sanctified behavior. Don't let people rob you of shining because they can't handle the glare. You attach your name to Jesus and everything that he calls you to, and you do it well by the power of his Spirit. Let's summarize. There's three things that a name does. It holds a place for you. It prophesies for you. And sometimes in the negative, it can even be a pseudonym. Don't worry about that. The first thing is that whoever names you uh, owns you. Revelation leads to renaming. Some people, of course, can't handle your name. You want to look beyond that. I don't know what your name is, even if you know what it means. You might not even care too much. But as PE was changed to Tabecha, maybe you need a name change, not a physical, legal name change. You need an identity change. You need to step into what God thinks of you, what God has for you, and what God has called you to do. I'd like to pray for you. And again, if you don't know Jesus, you are welcome to contact uh, us via the Facebook page, uh, via our website, phone me directly. Uh, you're at the church building. We'd love to chat to you and uh, explore Jesus with you um, if you are willing to do so. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that, dear Lord Father, you have changed our names from something that is dishonorable to honorable, that you sanctify us daily, dear Lord Father. And even though other people prophesy, sometimes through ignorance, and sometimes intentionally, dear Lord Father, negativity over our lives. We thank you that we can supersede it because you are in our lives and you break every curse in our lives. I pray, dear Lord Father, for those who are listening to this and are wanting breakthrough in terms of their identity. I ask that they would submit to your authority, dear Lord, so that you can rename them. I ask, dear Lord Father, that they'll continue to shine and shine brighter for you in the power of your Holy Spirit and that they would be effective in ministry because of their newfound clarity and identity. And so we commit them to you in Jesus' name and we ask that your will be done in all of our lives. Amen. God bless you.